Good evening. I'd like you to take your Bibles and go with me to Psalm 121. Now, this is one of the one of 15 Psalms from Psalm 121 to Psalm 134 that we call the Psalms of Ascent. Now we don't know who the author of this particular Psalm is. It's anonymous, although most of the Psalms of Ascent were written by either David or Solomon. The Psalms of Ascent also are called Psalms of Degrees or Pilgrim Psalms. That's because these were the songs that Hebrew travelers would sing as they entered into the city of Jerusalem for the yearly feasts and festivals. If you know a little bit about the geography of Jerusalem, it's literally a city that's built on a hill. These songs are called the Songs of Ascent because these were the songs that would be sung as the people were making the uphill journey into the city of Jerusalem. I want us to read Psalm 121, and then let's see what God will say to us through his word. Psalm 121, a psalm of ascent. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even evermore. Of course, the psalmist begins his writing with these famous words, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help? Now, we don't know the exact context of verse 1 of this psalm in general. We do know that the psalmist is obviously looking towards the hills. Now, this could be the hills along the road to Jerusalem, or this could be the hill that Jerusalem itself is settled on. It's interesting, though, that after saying, I will lift my eyes to the hills, the psalmist then asked this question about where his source of help was. Now, it wasn't really uncommon as a traveler at this time. It wasn't uncommon for thieves to, to hide in the hills and ambush unsuspecting travelers. It's possible that it's this fear that's provoking the psalmist to write these words as he, as he looks up towards the hills. This question is provoked within his own heart. Where does my help come from? If I were attacked, who's going to protect me? Maybe it's not that he's fearful of protection. Maybe it's actually that he's looking to the fear to the hills out of admiration. Imagine as you walk to the city of Jerusalem and you see the strength of God's city, the, the walls, the fortress. It must have been all inspiring for the traveler to see the city of Jerusalem off in the distance, the city on a hill. Yet it's interesting that the psalmist, whether he's looking at the hills fearful of being attacked or he's looking at the city in admiration, it's interesting that he's not trusting in the city of Jerusalem to protect and to provide for him. The psalmist says in verse 2, whether it's out of anxiety or out of admiration, the psalmist says when he looks to the hills and he asks the question, where does this help come from? He says in verse 2, my help comes from the Lord. The psalmist here is fully aware that security could be found nowhere but in the Lord and God. Now, I think we should pause here. We're in a, a completely different time in our nation, in our churches, in most of our lives than we've ever seen. And we've really got to pause here and ask ourselves a question. Do a little heart assessment. Where do we look for hell? When we're threatened, as we may perceive that we are right now, when we're threatened... I want to ask yourself this question. Do you turn to the Lord or do you grab your sword? By that I mean when you see the threat that comes from the hills, do you automatically think, what can I do to protect myself? Or does your heart automatically make a beeline to the Lord and says, the Lord is my help? How easily we're impressed, we're persuaded with the, with the power of material things to protect us. As the psalmist looks towards Jerusalem, He's not hoping for his help to come from Jerusalem. Times like the ones that we're currently going through, I think they bring us face to face with the reality of where we actually place our confidence. When we go through times of crisis like we're in right now, it reveals to us what God already knew, and that's what we're really trusting in for our help, for our hope. 
right now if, if your job is in jeopardy? And that might be many of you. If your job is in jeopardy, what has been the first inclination of your heart? Has your, your heart automatically ran towards panic? Or has your heart been settled in that you know that your God will provide your needs? He will provide the needs of your family. Who, who are you looking to right now for protection? Are you looking for Washington to protect you? Or are you looking for heaven to protect you? See, these times of crisis, they cause us to see the truth about ourselves. And, and I want to ask you in this time right now, be honest with yourself. Are you looking inward or are you looking upward? Are you planning or are you praying? Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with planning. Planning is an essential part of life, but, but planning can't do near what praying can do. As we're faced with this current crisis, the question I want you to ask yourself, what is this crisis revealing about my hope, about my health? Does it reveal that I really trust in me, or does it reveal that I really trust in God? Pressure has a way of revealing the cracks in our foundation. Crisis shows us where we really place our confidence. And crisis also shows us if that place we place our confidence, it will be sufficient for us in the time of trouble. Right now, I know our, our government is working hard to come up with answers. The medical professions are working hard to come up with answers. But the reality is, as of yet, they haven't come up with what can really fix this problem. And if we look only to them, we're going to be disappointed, we're going to be disillusioned, we're going to be fearful. What's happening right now is we're starting to see all around us, whether it's the economy and our bank accounts or, or the government or, or world institutions, what we're seeing right now is so many of those things are starting to crumble and it's bringing us back to the realization that we cannot place confidence in them. The only place where confidence can really be placed and never, uh, never fail us is in heaven, is in God Himself. This psalmist's hope, as he's hoping, as he's looking towards the hills, his hope for help was not in the government. It wasn't in Jerusalem. His hope for help was not in the environment. It wasn't that his hope would come from the hills. His hope was in the Lord. Furthermore, he recites the, the reasons for his confidence in verse 2. He says, my hope is in the Lord. And he says this in verse 2. He is the one who made heaven and earth. Of course, the psalmist's hope here is not in the, the mountains, but in the, the maker of the mountains. And, and the maker is far better than the mountains because he can't be shaken by the things that shake them. When I think about we, we can't avoid the current crisis, when I think about the virus that's going around, I've actually got good news for you, and that's that God is not affected by what affects us. Therefore, God can be effective against what infects us. What I mean by that is Corona cannot in any way affect or infect God. Now, when I say that, I mean it can't rise to the plane. Corona cannot rise to, it cannot survive on the plane which God lives. And by that, I don't mean that, that Corona can't fly high enough to touch heaven. What I mean is that God can't be touched by it because God is spirit and it's physical. If you were here in our service a couple weeks ago, we saw that the programmer who programs software can't be touched by the problems in the software. And in the same way, our God, the programmer, cannot be touched by the glitches in the software. Knowing that He's outside of this system we live in, knowing that He's not bound by time or, or by space, he, He's not bound by the things that we are bound by, knowing that, who better to have for your help than the Maker of heaven and earth? He is the God who is not infected or affected by the things that infect and affect us, therefore He can be effective against those things. When you think about who our God is, Literally, the whole creation, he's the maker of heaven and earth, so the whole creation is subject to his authority, including this virus. Nothing, nothing in the universe can taint God's economy. Why? Because he's the owner of a thousand universes. He's owner of all the resources and all the universes. Should he choose, he could speak newer, better, far more valuable resources into existence in less time than it takes for the bell to ring on Wall Street. If, if God is and he is the maker, then he can move the mountains as he pleases. He can part the waters and make a path through the sea. 
He can order the sun to stand still. He can enlist a fish to bring a runaway home. He can make water flow from a rock. He can fill the clouds with flowers so that bread rains from heaven. He can multiply a few sardines and crackers and, and feed thousands of people with it and still have some left over. He can make dead hearts beat. He can biologically alter the chemical compound of water and change it into the sweetest wine that lips have ever tasted. He can order the ravens to deliver meals to his people, and he can make sure there's always enough meal in the barrel. All those things are not just things that he can do. Those are things we see in Scripture that he has done. Again, like the psalmist, we have to ask ourselves, who would I rather have for my help? The mountain or the maker? And the obvious answer is the maker. When we ask ourselves, who would I rather have for help, the mountain or the maker? That's like asking, who do I want for my mechanic? The car or the engineer? To the psalmist, it didn't matter what evil came out of the mountain. It also didn't matter what good came out of the city. His confidence was rightly placed in the creator of heaven and earth, who is above all things. Furthermore, he says of the creator in verse 3, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Oh, this is so sweet to, to the believer who trusts in Christ. To anyone who is trusting in Him to direct their steps, we are assured that those people will not fall no matter how treacherous the road becomes. No matter the potholes, no matter how slippery and muddy things get, those who are trusting in Christ to direct their steps will not fall along the road. The Maker Himself is the, the one who assures this. He will not allow our feet to slip, even in the most slippery places. Why? Because He's our keeper. Verse 4 says, Behold, look, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. I love this. God has sworn Himself to be the, the keeper of His covenant people. That, and that assurance, he says here that, that uh, the keeper of Israel will ne neither slumber nor sleep. But this assurance also extends to the, the church. We are God's covenant people. And what we're told here is, is that the God who will not allow our foot to slip, this is the God who never slumbers. The God who keeps us, who protects us, never slumbers or, thinks, or sleeps. Let me, let me get you to think about this. God is not a, a hired guard who's paid to protect me but couldn't care any less about my welfare. God's not a, a watchman who will, who will fall asleep on the job. I am literally, and if you're in Christ, you are literally His prized possession. You are the prized possession of the most beautiful being in the pantheon of galaxies. You are the treasure of the most powerful being in existence. And for Him, protecting you is not just a duty that has been assigned to Him. It is His very delight, His very joy. Think about this. What, what kind of God is He that not only would He create us, but that He would invest all of His energy and resources in caring for us? If you, my friend, my friend, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, then that itself is an evidence that God has taken personal interest in you. If you've come to Christ by faith, that's because God draw you. That's because God called you. That's because God gave you the faith to believe. If you have come to Christ, that in itself is an evidence that God, that God himself cares so deeply for you. Your well-being, imagine this, your well-being is God's personal concern. Knowing that, I, I know He will not allow my foot to slip along the way. He's the protector of His people. We don't have to worry for one moment along the journey because our God is a God who never gets tired. He never needs a nap. He never slumbers or sleeps. The night guard of the watchman who falls asleep is useless, but God is the guard, the watchman, who's always awake, always watching. In every second of every moment, He's alert, He's aware of every adversary that could come against us. Every contagion that would try to fester in us, every need that we could possibly ever face, God is, is awake, God is aware of it, and He has already made plan and provision for it. And this will never change because He will never sleep. Verse 5 says, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. 
Well, the, the Lord God, the God of heaven and earth, guards us with all the, the ferociousness and the fury of a lioness who's guarding her cubs. The scripture tells us literally here that, that he is your shade. It says he's your shade, but it only doesn't tell us that he's our shade, that he protects us, but, but he is also our shield. If you look again at verse 5, verse 5 says the Lord is your keeper. The word translated keeper uh, in verse 5, or the word translated shade in verse 5 is also sometimes translated shield or defense in the scripture. What I want to point out to you here is that not only is the Lord our keeper and our shade, but, but he is the shield at our right hand. Now that's meaningful and that's interesting because in battle, the right side was a man's most vulnerable spot. His left side would have been protected by a shield while his right hand holds a sword, leaving the, leaving the right side of the body vulnerable and, and open for attack and exposed. But literally the psalmist tells us in verse 5, the Lord is your keeper, he's your shade, the word that can also be translated shield. He is the shield at your right hand. In other words, that tells me that God knows and God protects even my most vulnerable spots. Verse 6, because he is your keeper and because he's your shade. Verse 6 says, the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Because God is my shelter, I know nothing can touch me unless it passes through him. I am in Christ and Christ is in the Father, so literally nothing can come to me that does not pass through the Father and the Son. You know, the sun, if, if, if I were an inch closer, the sun could, could scorch me. The sun could absolutely obliterate me, turn me to ashes. The sun could scorch me, but this God who has sworn to be my protector has the power to scorch the sun. And by that, I don't mean he can just scorch the sun by speaking a word. I mean, literally his own being is brighter, more brilliant, more glorious than the sun itself. God could cause the sun by just his presence to turn to nothing more than, a, than ashes floating through the universe. And it's this God who has sworn to be my protection. That's why I can be confident that even the elements do not have any more power over me than God allows them to have over me. God's people can be confident that he is not going to allow anything into our shelter. He himself is our shelter and he will now allow nothing into the shelter that is not for our good. Up to this point, the psalmist has primarily spoken of physical protection and provision. But I want you to notice in the final paragraph, the, the writer of the psalm turns to more important themes and he turns from physical preservation to spiritual preservation. Verse 7, the psalmist says, The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. You know, we far too often, it's a human tendency, we fear the things that can harm us physically while we give so little thought to the things that can harm us spiritually. And in truth, spiritual harm is far more dangerous than physical harm. But here we're given an assurance for those who have come to Christ by faith, those who are God's covenant people, those who are sealed by the blood of Christ and by the Spirit. We're given this assurance here that not only will God protect our bodies, we're given this assurance that God can and will preserve our souls. This is important on several levels, one though being that God may sometimes allow things that destroy the body into the shelter. God in His sovereignty, in His goodness, and in His, in His wisdom will sometimes allow things in, even to the shelter, to, to harm this physical body. But what we're promised here is that God will never allow anything to harm the soul of the people who have trusted in Him. You see, by nature, every one of us, we're perishable people. Sin is, is like a rot, and it permeates and it destroys. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I plant my garden every year, I pick the produce, and I'm very aware that that produce isn't going to last very long because it's going to start to mold. It's going to start to rot. From the inside out, it's going to start to become useless. Well, that's exactly what sin does to humans. From the inside out, it causes us to rot. It causes us to become useless and perishable. 
By nature, we are perishable people, just like fresh produce. We won't last forever. Something has to, for us to last, something has to preserve us. We have to be affected by an outside agent. According to the scripture, when any man comes to Christ, the scripture tells us that not only does he come to Christ, but Christ comes to him. When we come to Christ, the unending life of God, Jesus himself, literally comes to dwell within us. We can't explain this union, but we know it to be true. So when we come to Jesus, we are, by God himself, united with him. Our souls are united with Christ himself. And being united with Christ, all of his life is infused into us. Therefore, having literally the very life of God in us, we will live, every child of God will live as long as God lives. See, that's why the psalmist is saying that he not only protects us from the evil without, the psalmist is saying that God preserves us from the evil within. God himself has introduced a preservative agent to our soul to give us life and render us non-perishable items. The psalm con psalmist concludes with these words in verse 8. Oh, the Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Our going out and our coming in represents, the, I think, the whole of our lives. We're given this final conclusion by the psalmist that both now and forever we can rest because we know our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I want to ask you as we close this time of studying the Word, what is this crisis revealing to you about where you place your hope, where you place your confidence? As much as we, we hope for the good of our nation, as much as we pray for the good of our world, the reality is the government can't fix this issue. The reality is that, that no one can stop the crisis we're facing right now except for God Himself. And in this crisis, maybe what God is doing is He's trying to use this to, to shake you and to wake you up and to see that you're trusting in things that can't help. You're trusting in things that have no power. And what I want to ask you is when you look to the hills, whether it's the awe-inspiringness the, the of this world or whether it's the anxiety that comes from what may come from the hills, when you look to the hills and you ask yourself, where does my help come from? Can you confidently, from the heart, can you confidently say, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The God who will both protect my flesh and preserve my soul. Can you honestly from the heart say, my hope is in the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray now that you'll take your word, encourage your people, remind us of your faithfulness, remind us of your ability. God, you're able to take care of us and God, even if you should so sovereignly choose to allow some of us to be sick or even to die, Father, even in that, we're confident, we're, we're happy, we can rejoice because, God, even in that, you are the one who not only protects the body but preserves the soul. Lord, the worst thing that this virus can do to any of us is bring us home to you. So, Father, I pray for your people now that you would use this word to comfort them, to remind them that you are their sovereign God who is their protector, their provider, their preserver. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I hope our study in God's Word tonight was helpful to you. Before we go, I want to take a moment and pray together. And I invite you right where you are to stop and to pray with me. Let's go to the throne of grace together. It's an amazing thing that, that God's throne is the only throne in human history that we're told is called a, a, throne of, a throne of grace and a mercy seat. I want us to pray for something specific tonight. I've had this on my heart for the past couple of days thinking about people specifically in our church family and others that we know who struggle with depression and anxiety. I know being stuck inside right now and not knowing what the future holds is probably especially hard on those people. So what I want us to do tonight, Scripture tells us that we're to bear one another's burdens. And I want to invite you right where you are to stop with me and to bow your heads and let's approach the throne of grace together and ask God to give special help and special comfort 
to those who are struggling mentally right now with things that are probably beyond their control. Will you pray with me? Lord, God, we know and we have specific people in mind who are probably struggling right now, not knowing what the future holds, and, and Lord, with, with already having tendencies towards depression and towards anxiety, Father, I can see how this time would be even harder on some of those people. Lord, I know how people might be suffering right now, but God, you know much better than I do. God, you are the God who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Lord, you're the God who became one of us and dwelt among us and felt what we feel. Lord, you endured the struggles that we endure. Lord, you were tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Father, I, I pray, Lord, from the bottom of my heart tonight, I pray that you would give special comfort and help to those in our church family who are struggling, Lord, not just with a lack of faith right now, but Lord, with a, with a true mental, uh, a mental brokenness, Lord. Lord, those who are depressed, those who have anxiety, Father, I pray that you would come close to them. Father, I pray that you would comfort them. God, I pray that you would give them peace. Uh, Lord, a calmness in the soul that, that is just resting in you, is trusting in you. Lord, none of us know what the future holds. And God, we don't want to be cliche, but we do know and we're confident that you hold the future. God, we thank you even. God, we thank you that you're allowing us to go through this time. God, I pray that you use this for the purposes that you have ordered it. God, I pray that as we come out of this period of life, that our faith will be stronger. Lord, in this time, I pray that you'll prove yourself to us, that we'll grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Oh, Lord, I, I, I can honestly say, Lord, though I would not have chose this, Lord, I thank you that you've allowed this because, Lord, I know you're working good in it. God, again, before, before we close, will you please care for those in our family, Lord, who are suffering mentally right now with, with darkness, with shadows, with depression. Lord, I pray that you would be their comfort. And, Lord, I pray that you would bring those individuals to our mind so, Lord, we can reach out, we can contact them, we can call them. Show kindness and show support. Lord, we love you. We love you so much, and we thank you that you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, you can certainly go down in the comments section and post a prayer request, and we will be certain to pray for those things. Uh, if you have needs that maybe we can assist with, please uh, reach out to us any way that we can help. We would be happy to. Thank you for watching and listening today. I hope it's been encouragement, and we will see you again Sunday at 1 o'clock.